you there and like how you how you got you know what, how you heard about it what what made you continue with it because I, I think origin story for people are really interesting. Okay, yeah. So um so and this won't come to a time like this. Okay, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's not a very long story. So I think it's in um, around February or March of 2012, the time that I think a lot of people learned about the project. Um, I think I had, for whatever reason, I had decided it was time to take a tally of, of uh, my programming over the last year because I had a sense, so I was a MATLAB, full-time MATLAB user, and I had a sense that I was starting to spend more of my time writing C than MATLAB, and so I tallied it up and um, I discovered I had written 70 MEX files over the course of the previous year. And for those of you who have ever written those, you know that often if it's even just a few lines of actual algorithm that's computing, it sometimes takes 50 or more lines of code to wrap, you know, wrap your C code, basically. And I was starting to question whether I was really getting a lot of value out of this for the types of problems that, that I was working on at the time. And it was basically like the day I did the tally was, I, I actually saw it later, I think, than most of the rest of the world because I don't frequent the sort of blogging sites very much. But, um, but uh, this, this post on why we created Julia came out and uh, I think about four hours or so of digging into it, like, okay, I've got to try this. This place is pretty cool. And that, that, was, that was pretty much it. So, yeah, so, was, so I guess I've been using it for a little over two years now. I'd also just simply like to comment that I think it's, this is a remarkable um, uh, uh, success to get to the point where this language created by a very small number of people uh, initially is, is uh, getting its own conference. So I think that's a really, really amazing achievement. Else you want to? All right. So let me uh, let me get started. So um, so you know this is a conference on computing. It's actually the first such conference I've ever attended. And, but I'm here because um, <laughs> of uh, my interest in a different form of computing, and that is the computing that the brain does. And actually, maybe for this early part, can we have the lights down just a little bit? Is that possible? So, so, um, so, you know, the brain is arguably the most complicated, you know, computing device that there is in existence. It's, it's not a huge deal. If we, there you go, that, that'll work pretty well. Um, and what I'm showing you here is an image of actual brain. This is a tiny, tiny segment from the brain of a mouse. There have been some clever tricks played here to get the different neurons, the individual cells in the brain, to glow in different colors. Essentially, each neuron picks a random color, if you will, and this allows you to sort of see the, the, the structure that's that's present in this tissue. And I think, you know, for me, looking at these images, I, I love seeing them. And to this day, it, it, it always sort of makes me look at this and want to know sort of, okay, what's really going on inside of this circuit? And it's a complicated problem because, in part, each one of these um, individual uh, uh, cells is itself actually a reasonably sophisticated, reasonably complicated machine. And then it's the connection between them and how they send information from one to the next that gives rise to much of the computational complexity that underlies our perceptions and our thoughts, for example. Um, and uh, so, you know, the task of really trying to understand how these how these circuits work, there is no debugger uh, available for um, you know for, for neural architectures. And so it's a, oh here, um, let's see, we'll, we'll keep that alive there. It's, it's a daunting problem. So, um, so my lab got interested in sort of trying to develop new tools for trying to better understand the function of these neural circuits. And so my lab is actually one of a small handful of labs to independently um, invent a technique that, that's become known as light sheet microscopy. And the idea behind this is to use imaging to probe function in the nervous system. And the reason this is called light sheet microscopy is that it sort of changes up the way microscopy is usually done. And it illuminates the tissue with just this thin sheet of light. You park this sheet of light in the focal plane of your optical system, of your microscope, and then the innovation that we contributed, aside from the light sheet itself, um, which again several other groups also independently came up with, was to couple the light sheet to the uh, microscope and therefore very quickly sort of see the three-dimensional structure of the tissue. And for us, the main interest is actually less in the sort of uh, shape of the tissue, if you will, and more in what it's doing. And there are some clever um, tools available today that are entirely the work of other people that allow you to express proteins in those cells that become brighter when the cells are active, when they're actually computing and talking, and dimmer when they're not. And so using those tools 
And this imaging technique, you can actually see neurons computing in three dimensions. And so this is a volume from, from the mouse nervous system of about 10,000 neurons at once. We're puffing on different odors onto this uh, tissue. And what you're seeing is the individual cells that are selective for individual uh, uh, odors <coughs> lighting up uh, when, that, when that odor is being delivered. So this is already, you know, at the time we did this, this was by far the largest number of neurons that anyone had ever been able to record from to study functionally at one time uh, before. Um, it's still a tiny fraction of the entire brain of a mouse, which is around 100 million neurons or so. It's about 10,000 10, neurons at once. However, in uh, smaller creatures like this small transparent uh, fish, the brains are small enough and transparent enough that you can largely see much of what is actually happening uh, or you can see much of the brain, and so you can actually, again, uh, sort of get data on what the individual neurons throughout mo most, most of the animal's brain, or at least large portions of the animal's brain, are actually doing. Um, and so, and I should say all this was rendered in Julia, um, uh, and I'm looking forward to Simon Danish's work, which should make this uh, about 100 times more efficient than my own uh, CPU-based algorithms. Or so anyway, so, um, just a, a few numbers. Um, it may or may not be apparent that these, th this technique's main virtue is its speed. So you can very quickly image in three dimensions. And to get, because the nervous system operates really on a millisecond time scale, we try to go as fast as we possibly can with our imaging. And that means that we're just collecting data as fast as it will go. So. Um, uh, these days, that means it's about a gigabyte, a little over a gigabyte of data every second is coming in from a camera. In order to keep up with that, we have to spool it to a RAID array of 16 hard drives. Um, and for us, a typical experiment is somewhere between uh, one and four terabytes in size. And we might do up to three experiments in one day. All right. So um, it's trying to sort of cope with these large data sets is the main attractant for me in coming to a language that allowed expressive programming, but also provided high performance. And so what I'm going to do today is give a bit of an overview, specifically on the image side of things, um, and tell you a little bit about where we are today um, and, and uh, hopefully some of the promise for the future. So uh, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, sort of, you know, the, the image analysis uh, is, is an early component of Julia's history. It certainly predates my own um, involvement in the project. So long before the, the, in the dark days before there was a package manager, um, there was this directory in the Git uh, repository called Extras, and there was a file in there uh, called images.jl. And that was really the, the origin of a lot of the image processing uh, in, in Julia. Um, and the main authors of that file, if I'm uh, remembering the GitHub history correctly, were Jeff and St uh, Stefan, but not Stefan Karpinski, Stefan Krobov. Um, and um, at a certain point, this became a, uh, a standalone repository, the images, images package. Um, and um, so the early commit history is lost because it moved out of the main GitHub uh, uh, history. Um, but at least since it became a package, it's, it's I would say, sort of a, a, a moderate-sized project. There are a little over 400 commits now. In that there have been 14 contributors since it became an independent package. Um, <coughs> I'll highlight two people, Ron Rock and, and Lucas uh, Beyer, um, have been pr particularly uh, stalwart contributors to the package. Um, it's about, it, it's, I would say, you know, it, for an image library, it's still quite small. So there are about 4,300 lines of code for the core functionality, and there are about 1,800 for uh, supporting different file formats. The only reason that the file format code is, is uh, so modest in size is that we rely on image magic for in import of most common formats. So we can, of course, support a lot of formats, um, but the custom code really only needs to be written for specialized formats so far, which are of the type that uh, come up often in scientific uh, um, so, um, so the package, I think, actually already has quite a lot of functionality, but it, I would also still sort of characterize it as saying it's early in development. I mean, the mature image libraries are often a decade-long uh, uh, process, and, and we're certainly not uh, at a decade of development yet. Um, and the final point is, is that the images package, which is what I'm going to be focusing on, is developed in parallel with another package called Image View. Um, and uh, this is for the visualization purposes, although again, I'm looking forward to um, expanded visualization opportunities on the horizon. Um, and uh, the image view package has also gotten some significant contributions, again, from Ron Rock and also Kevin Squire. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to kind of try to do two things in the talk. 
um, to appeal to sort of, if you will, two different audiences. For the first part, I want to sort of kind of give almost like a user level introduction to images and talk a little bit about the design principles that went into it um, and just show you a little bit of, the, of some of the things that you can do with it. And then the second part of my talk, I'm going to um, try to sort of give a developer's view and that is to convey at least a couple of the lessons that I've learned over time in trying to uh, write efficient algorithms for, uh, for, for processing images. Okay, so the package uh, sort of ideally I think has two main target audiences. One is the, is the people who are interested in computer vision, and the second audience is the people who are using it for scientific imaging. And that certainly fits, the latter is what fits me, and I should say that that's actually what has, uh, also characterizes most of the people who have contributed to the image packages so far. So I think we're already getting the point of offering some uh, really interesting advantages to the scientific imaging crowd, and I think we have farther to go on the computer vision, uh, computer vision side of things. Um, so um, one of the, there are a number of things that really influence the design, and one of them is the fact that images come, um, or, or can, can, especially like my own images, can be very large. Um, so we want to be able to support uh, things like movies that have, are not just a standard RGB picture, for example, but they may have a temporal dimension to them. They may be three-dimensional images. We even talk about five-dimensional images sometimes, which is you know, three spatial dimensions, time, and color. Um, and you know we need to be able to process images that are much larger than the available RAM in the machine. Right? So all of these are really important considerations for the design of the package. Um, it, one of the challenges in doing this is, is that images are very diverse. So there's the canonical sort of 8-bit RGB image. Um, and, and that's uh, obviously a crucial format to be able to support very well. But you know, uh, scientists often will have 16-bit image, grayscale images, because this is what is captured by their monochrome cameras. And you know, if you look at the history of, of packages that handle images, many of the really impressive packages, like GIMP and other things like that, took a long time to start developing good support for 16-bit images. And you know, that's something in part, but largely because of the design of Julia. You know, we we want to, you know. We're, we're there, I think, already, and, and, and want to make sure that that's something we support well. And we just, of course, can also have transparency, and I think that's, again, something that we, we seek to provide good support for. Um, scientists even have more wacky things than this. There's a type of imaging called hyperspectral imaging, where you might actually, for instance, collect the intensity at a single pixel in 32, at 32 separate wavelengths, basically, right? So that just simply the description of one pixel is, is, a, is an array of 32 numbers, for example. And that's that's a grow. It's actually a growing market in the imaging community. Again, we want to be able to support people who are doing that kind of thing. Um, some of the other formats that are uh, 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 tax your uh, you're thinking about this are things like the YUV formats. These are often used for uh, compressing movies, for example. And you know, here these are sort of canonically come as a 2D array, but it's a single 2D array that encodes the, the, the uh, color information as well. But the intensity information, for instance, is, is this upper portion, the Y portion of the array, and the sort of uh, uh, chroma characteristics are in a, in a compressed format uh, down here, right? Where one number here refers to four, four pixels worth of, of information up there. So even the physical size, if you think about this as an array and you think about an RGB image as an array, even just the physical size of the, of the, of the data uh, don't necessarily tell you the same thing as the spatial size of the data in this case. Um, there are another thing that uh, uh, adds some complexity uh, is the fact that in scientific imaging it's not at all uncommon to have what I would call a multi-camera image and this uh, sort of illustrates it here. You have your sample that you're looking at down here and then there's a mirror that reflects the blue light in this direction, the red light up there, and you have two separate cameras and so you're collecting two separate images. You're often using the vendor software so these are going to be written to two separate files. Each file might be you know, one megabyte or it might be one terabyte, um, and uh, you. But yet, the image data you want to process it has to essentially weave these things together, right? So these are all sort of interesting ways in which just the raw representation of images can can vary a great deal. <clears throat> and then the final thing about images is that you often need some kind of metadata for uh, describing them. So, for instance, if you're processing a, a fMRI scans, you might need the patient ID. 
if you're an astronomer, you might uh, need to know what region of sky your telescope was pointed at when you took the image. Um, you know, as a scientist, I often want to know how do the digital numbers that are reported by my camera convert into something with honest physical units like photons, um, the number of photons, for example, etc. So all this kind of stuff there. And, and especially if you're thinking about three-dimensional imaging, the whole representation of coordinates is a really important issue. How is how is the image array uh, oriented with respect to external physical world coordinates, for example? So um, basically, with images, we want to be able to support everything from people who would rather just use a plain old array uh, of just the plain numbers to people who need to tag their images in, in relatively sophisticated ways. And so this led me, for better or for worse, to uh, adopt a, a very, very simple format for an image. And the basic idea, so, so for a while I tried to have a reasonably um, complicated, I think is the right description for it, type system that would allow you to uh, you know, uh, encode the, di the different data that I thought you might need for individual images. And at a certain point, I just abandoned that and, and sort of came to the conclusion that what you really needed for as the basis of a library was a, really just a documentation of that. And that is that an image is simply a set of array data um, uh, that might be of any form, and, it, and it's not necessarily laid out in memory in any uh, 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 stereotyped fashion, um, and then allow you to, to describe what's in that. And so I, I just uh, switched to using an untyped uh, properties dictionary that allows you to uh, essentially assign values to uh, to whatever characteristics you might want. This. And so, really, I do. I think of this as a documentation format. It's just there to bundle your, you know, pixel data together with enough information about what that pixel data means in order to do something useful with it. Okay. Um, and um, it, in a sense, this is actually a very non-Julian design because you can't do multiple dispatch, for example, on a property <coughs> dictionary. But um, I think because it's very hard to predict the number of the different types of images that people will be using, I at least found that I was very unsuccessful in being more prescriptive about that. And so the other thing is, is that if you're processing images, I have yet to find a real world circumstance in which the sort of um, uh, uh, you really need to do dispatch for efficiency reasons on the image as a whole, because usually parsing some aspect of the properties dictionary um, is uh, a negligible component of your processing time compared to what you actually need to do for the raw pixel data. Okay, so um, there is a little bit of a hierarchy, type hierarchy inside of images. It's very simple. Images descend from the abstract array, um, and, and you can just use arrays as images. You actually don't have to encapsulate them in any type and the algorithms of the images packages just work. Um, there's a notion of an abstract image, and then really there are sort of two, uh, the, the split that matters is this differentiation between direct images, meaning where the values are, are of each pixel are encoded in a single array versus images where you have to look up the value uh, of a pixel in a color map, for example. Okay. So um, I, I, for, um, at, at great risk, I decided that the best thing to do is actually show a sort of real-time uh, demos, and so we'll see if I manage to embarrass myself by uh, uh, uncovering bugs or something like that. But, um, so um, this is an iJulia session, probably everybody <coughs> knows that, and um, I've, I've preloaded a, a, a couple of the packages that, that we will need to work with this here. I'm going to load up a simple uh, test image here um, called Auto Leaves. Um, and we'll uh, see this here, and so boom, a pops in iJulia with the actual graphical representation of the image. And this is a very uh, nice thing about about uh, working through iJulia, being able to see the raw image. There are for learning to use the images package. It's often actually a good idea to make sure that you're looking at the sort of more uh, raw representation of the image itself, and that that happens automatically in the REPL. Um, if you're in iJulia, you can just simply display the same image in a different way as a, as a text plane line type. And when you do that, this is what you see that this that this image is here. Okay, so um, I'm just going to briefly walk you through uh, this, the information that's here. So first of all, it's got those two fields, the data array and properties dictionary. Um, here you can see that this array is actually it's a UN16. So this is a 16-bit image, uh, three-dimensional image, of course, uh, with these dimensions. And then it has because as we loaded it from disk here, it came pre-populated with a number of individual properties. So the first property here um, is called the color space, and this specifies what color space this array information is supposed to be interpreted in. So this turns out to be a, 
uh, an image with transparency, an alpha RGB image. Um, this tells you that the first dimension of the array is what corresponds to the color. You could have any choice that you actually want. Um, this next one actually here it names the individual dimension, spatial dimensions of the array, and then this tells you uh, sort of what range of values you should expect. And this is this isn't very useful in this context, but it comes into its own if you are doing scientific imaging. And for instance, you may have a 12-bit camera or a 10-bit uh, camera. You need uh, a, a UN16 to represent the raw pixel data, but you're uh, you're never anywhere close to the, to the to the maximum of the type in terms of the intensities. So for just simply setting contrast limits, uh, sensible contrast limits for display, it's very useful to actually have some sense of, the, of those limits there. Okay, so um, the best way to interact with, uh, with image objects um, is to use uh, a set of functions that extract these things. Rather, you can, of course, reach in and deal with the properties of the dictionary directly, but it's much better to use the, the, the functions. So, for instance, if we use the color space function on this image, um, you can see it returns the ARGB uh, for it. Um, the, the advantage of this is that if you write your algorithms in terms of these functions, then it, everything just works, even if you supply a, a, an array here, right? So this is, this is an, an image that's in the sort of conventional MATLAB format. So these are the uh, Y and X coordinates, and this is, the, this is the color dimension here. And so if we, if we ask there, then, then our color space is an RGB color space. So that's, that's, that's inferred there. Whereas if you supply something without that third dimension, then you can see that it tells us that it's a, that it's a grayscale image. Um, if we go back to our original image here and uh, you know, ask what the color dimension is, you know, it'll, it'll return one. So just another, another example of that. Um, the, uh, there are a number of functions that you can call on images and they return image objects that sometimes actually end up having to manipulate the properties. So for example, if we call permute, dimin, permute dims, which is, uh, you know, permutes the dimensions of an array, for example, if you do that on an image object here, so we're, we're putting now the color dimension, uh, uh, this was the color dimension, we're putting that one first, or last, sorry, now we're putting the Y before the X. Now here you see what you get out, you see that this image here now, of course, the array has been removed. <coughs> but the other thing is, is, that the, is that the property information has been switched, so you are now keeping track of the fact that color is now the third dimension in the spatial order rather than being x, y like it was here, which would be sort of a, what I would call horizontal major, and kind of like if you think about these as major C's like a row major matrix. Um, this one is a, is a vertical major uh, array because the y axis is the fast axis and the x is the, is the next one. All right. And some of the other types of operations also update those properties. And so for instance, here, if you just simply scale an image by 0.01, you can see that the value of the limits field will change um, in addition, of course, to the, to the underlying type, uh, the underlying type of the array. Okay, so um, uh, you know, this just sort of gives you a sense of what information is by default carried around with you. But of course, keep in mind that you can add, you know, images act a lot like dictionaries. You can add a new property just by uh, uh, you know, uh, assigning, a, assigning a property with a new name. And then you in your own personal code can make use of that property in your functions as well. So that's what I mean by it's a documenting format. You, the, uh, the goal is to always know what you're working on. Right? So even, even if you, the programmer, know, but the algorithm itself might not know and it might have to make decisions based on what's in the image. And so the idea is just document what's there and then you know, I or you or somebody else will write the code to, to deal with it properly. Um, so um, the fact that you have some of these operations that manipulate the properties dictionary, again, I think that's a, that's a great thing when you're working at the level of whole images. It's a pretty bad feature, I think, if you were working at the level of individual pixels, because suddenly then the overhead of massaging a property dictionary becomes very, very noticeable. And largely for that reason, um, the standard indexing operations just return numbers. So, they, so they, they extract the elements of the array without wrapping them in an image type. And that's true whether you're asking for scalar values or whether you are asking for regions of an array, for example. Right? In, in both cases, you're always going to be returning numeric data. Um, and you can do that with a sort of standard operations there. Of course, there's also the slice function, which creates a subarray. Um, and again, that, that just simply returns the raw subarray without packaging it inside of, inside of an image type. Sometimes, of course, you want to get an image back that keeps track of things. And so um, the, the sort of three core functions that, that we have for extracting regions of arrays, all you have to do is append an M at the end of them. 
and then they will return the object as an M, so as an image. So here, if we call slice M on this image, and we're slicing here along the first axis, which is the color axis, you get something back like this. And so again, it's a six by six array here of, of the data. And the properties here now, the color space, it, it detected the fact that you, since you're calling slice, you're getting rid of the color dimension, and so now the color dimension is set to zero, and it's of an unknown color space. It's no longer the ARG color space that you were in, in the first place. Okay. So again, the, a lot of these operations are sort of, uh, you know, it's a largely a bookkeeping exercise, if you will, to sort of keep track of these properties um, uh, as they go on. One of the other most powerful things for writing generic code is the fact that you don't always have to do everything with just numerical indexing, right? When I write this expression here, what I'm meaning to say is that I'm extracting a particular component of the color axis, right? But uh, that's because I know, happen to know as the user that this particular image um, has its color axis first, right? And if you want to really write generic code, that's not always a great assumption to be able to make. And so images also allows you to, to do indexing, and, and maybe I maybe here's a more conventional sort of uh, look at indexing right down here. You can index using named the named coordinates. So you remember here we, we, we named the coordinates here. You can actually pick whatever names you want, and that's again very useful in 3D imaging where you might actually want to represent these relative to some physical external coordinate system. Um, but as, then as long as you index with the actual names of the array, um, then, then it will do that. So for instance, here we can extract the alpha channel um, you know, here by, uh, you know, by, by indexing along the color dimension of the array. And we're taking the first component of that color dimension. Um, and so, which is the alpha channel. Um, and um, you know, here's an example where we're, we're, we're taking a subset of the region of the, of, the, of the image this way. And again, the nice thing about this is, is that you're, all, you, you're, you're getting what you mean to get out of it rather than relying on some storage order for the underlying uh, array data. Um, uh, we can, you can see some of the other nice possibilities of this kind of sort of generic coding, if you will, by let's load up a, just a variety of different image here. So we're going to load up the uh, mandrel test image. And sometimes, I don't know why, but I, Julia often starts out with the images pretty small. So you know, that's, that's the mandrel image here. We can see what this is. This is a, an RGB image. And so we know from that that the <coughs> first component is the R and the third component is the B. And so down here, we're going to extract the red color channel and the, and the blue color channel. And then what I want to do is I'm going to actually put them back together again. Um, in, um, and, and I'm using a, a, a tool that's called an overlay image to do that. And the, just, just to sort of show you that I've actually done something here, um, I'm going to put them back in a way so that the red channel is encoded in green and that the blue channel is encoded in magenta. Okay? And if I do that, then you see an image like this one here, make it bigger so you can see, really see it. So it's a sort of an odd looking thing, right? Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, you might, for instance, just to show you again some of the things you can do with this, it doesn't actually look so much this way on this projector, but on my laptop screen at least, the magenta looks kind of washed out. So you can actually also specify color limits for define what's saturated in that image and uh, um, by, by adding some extra information here several ways to supply that extra information. Um, and uh, you, know, you get something like this, which you hopefully can see is slightly different, at least from the, from the other image there, for example. All right, now let's look and see what these, this actual overlay image is. And so it's, it's actually a type based on an abstract array type called an overlay. Um, you can see it doesn't have a color dimension because these are automatically interpreted as an RGB image, meaning the RGB type from color. Um, and so there's no axis of the array that corresponds to color anymore. Um, and here it's showing the space order. Interpreting the data array is a little bit complicated, so let's just simply extract those, and you can see them in a sort of a prettier form. And what you can see is that the, 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 the individual channel, so it so happens that an overlay has a field called channels. And what you can see is actually that the individual ch component channels of the array are actually uh, maintained as their separate entities. And the reason for this is, so that what this really is, in, in a sense, I think, is, is the lazy overlay, if you will, right? What you're doing is you're describing the fact that you want to overlay these images, but you're not going ahead at the moment that the user calls that and 
doing the computation that actually you know generates the final uh, overlaid image. And the reason for that again is situations you know like this where um, uh, you know you might for instance be doing this multi uh, file imaging something like this. And so each one of the raw images might actually be it might each image might be a movie sequence and it you know, might be each one might be a terabyte in size and there's no reason that you should wait for an entire couple terabytes worth of computation occurs just to start being able to look at your image and so the idea is is to have a way of describing and, and, and this this design philosophy really permeates a lot of the images package that you try to do as many things in a lazy way as possible so that if a user just simply then wants to pull this up and start looking at the image he or she can very quickly navigate to maybe the you know two percent of the image uh, that actually matters to them and see it without having to wait for a whole lot of computations to to take place. Okay, so that's one set of demos. Um, I want to actually run some other demos, which for complicated reasons actually work better in um, uh, uh, in, in the standard REPL. And so um, I'm going to just uh, run some of those for you. And these are going to uh, illustrate image view. And so here I'm going to load a data set from my, from my own lab. This is using the format NRRD, which is probably my favorite format for, for scientific data interchange because it, generally, it does an unusually good job of documenting the, the geometry relative to the external world. Um, and so here, you can, this is actually a tiny snippet of, of data of one of these 3D images that, that we've collected in the lab. Um, so you can see this is it's a 3D image. It's got three spatial coordinates here. Um, uh, it's a grayscale image. One of the, the fun things that you can do in images here is you can see the, this pixel spacing field. So when you start doing 3D imaging, um, you, you know, for 2D images, you can usually pretty safely make the assumption that each pixel is square. Right? But when you're doing 3D imaging, that you, you, you can't really make the assumption that each pixel is a cube, right? They're, they're often cuboidal, um, but they may, be, they may have a different sampling along the z-axis, for instance, than the x and y. And that's the case here, where there's a half micron spacing between pixels in the x and y, but there's a five micron spacing between the, uh, along the z-axis. And so you can see that that information is being encoded here, and it's being encoded using the uh, SI units package, um, uh, and, and, and that allows for, for some pretty fun things there, too. So, okay, so we're going to take a look at this image now and view it. We're going to view it inside of um, this uh, other um, package, uh, image view, um, that I've written. I'm, I should say I'm using the GTK branch of this. The official one is, a, is, is based on TK. Um, and, uh, 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 but, so you can, you can check out the GTK branch if you, if you like. And I think there are some advantages there, although both of them uh, work. So, um, so first of all, this image is in white, and the reason why it's white is because it, it, there's no information yet in the properties about sort of what range of values you expect the image to have. Um, uh, and since the image type is a float 32, it's going to make the assumption that it, the, the, that it goes from 0 to 1. In that particular case, that happens to be a bad assumption. Um, and so um, one of the things that image, uh, uh, image view lets you do is set the contrast limit. So I'm going to go to a particular image. And then there, if you right click on the image, oh, I guess the main part of this demo is to show you that, there's, that this is a reasonably interactive uh, package. So you can adjust the contrast of the image here. It's going to pop up a window based on, on uh, uh, Winston that will show us the, um, um, oh, that's good. No. Uh, it'll show us the, the histogram, right? So if you drag the slider bar here, you're affecting the, 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 the range here that's in the image. And so if I do this, you can see the, uh, you know, see the uh, uh, contrast of the, of the raw image changing here. You can type in a fixed value if you want. And you can, of course, supply these values programmatically if you prefer to do that. Okay, so we can make this a little bit bigger um, so that it's easier to see. And so um, what image view allows you, so this is, this is a 4D image. It's three spatial dimensions in time. It actually gives you these various navigation uh, controls here. Um, so there's the z-axis here. So we're on the 31st slice here. And you can cycle through the image just by dragging these. And if you've used MATLAB, for instance, you're probably familiar with the fact that at least in the current incarnations of MATLAB, you know, the image doesn't update as you drag the slider bars, only when you let go that they do. So this makes it rather a, a much more friendly sort of way to explore large imaging data sets. Um, um, it, it has all the, you know, you can zoom in on a region here, right? And if I'm, if I'm using my real mouse, I can scroll that way. And if I hold the shift key down, it scrolls back and forth like that. If I double click, I go back out to the sort of the full size there, for example. 
Um, and I can play it as a movie in time. I can set the, um, the playback speed if I want. So instead of 30 frames a second, I can drop it down to 10 frames <coughs> per second um, and play it forwards and backwards. And for scientific imaging, it's really useful to have these little edit boxes because if, you've, if your movie has 50,000 frames in it and you know something really interesting happens at frame 29,248, you can just navigate right to that spot. <laughs> so, um, Okay, so, so all those are very useful. Some of the other features, though, that are present in ImageU have not been very well advertised, at least not until Kevin Squire made a really nice uh, contribution uh, and a huge extension of this functionality. This is the annotation functionality of, the, of, of images. And so let me just, uh, again, for, so I don't mistype things, I'm just copying and pasting. I'm going to add a scale bar to this image. And one of the things to note about this, how I'm specifying this scale bar, the most important part for our purposes here, is I'm going to specify this as a 10 micron scale bar. I just type this using the lovely uh, 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 new features here, right? I just hit, uh, uh, hit tab, and I'll use it. Oh, sorry, M, there we go. That's why I didn't, I wasn't typing all this. So. Um, uh, so I'm going to specify that this is uh, a 10 micron size scale bar, and this makes sense because I've specified my pixel spacing in units of, of meters also, right? And so I can do I can add that um, thing there. Um, I'm also going to circle a, a neuron that I find. Uh, wow, wait, this is a really fascinating one. So we'll actually add a little circle there. All right, and so here now you can hopefully see there's a scale bar up in the image here. Um, this is it's pretty dark, right? Oh, okay, let's see actually here. So. Um, so, okay, there we go. <coughs> so uh, here you can see a red circle around this particular bright neuron. Here is the, here, here is the scale bar here. And you know, what you can see, for instance, is that as you, you know, this circle exists in the, the plane in which I defined it by virtue of, of how I did the annotation there. Um, one of the other, uh, you know, if I play the movie, you can see the annotation stay there, uh, overlaid on top of the raw data. If I zoom in on a subset of the image there, here you can see that they scale appropriately, right? So the scale bar is physically bigger on the screen than it used to be. It's still measuring 10 microns. The circle is still staying here. And if I sort of pan, one of the interesting things that you see is that there are actually a couple types of annotation. Some of them float on top of the image and are independent of the particular spot that you're looking, other than getting the scale set correctly, whereas others are tied, you know, are anchored <coughs> to the data and move as you move the data. Okay? So, um, and one of the things we desperately need to do is add a, you know, annotate image to this menu here, and that's actually something I'm already working on, so to make it easier. But there's already, I think, a fairly easy, easily used programmatic interface, and I can even say, for instance, I can just say delete circle, and now I go back and look at my image, and you can see now the circle is gone. Right? So um, it, it makes the annotations rather than the All right, that's, that's all I wanted to show for that. And in my last couple of minutes, I want to very, very briefly touch on the second topic, which is the issue of writing efficient algorithms. And I'm going to try to make this pretty fast. So this is really targeted more towards people who might want to develop for images, and it's just really to sort of share some of my experience in learning what, what works and what doesn't in terms of writing things efficiently. So efficiency is obviously key because images have so much data in them. Let's take a really simple example like writing an infilter function. So if you use MATLAB, you know that this is the thing that does uh, digital filtering. So if, you, if your image is represented here by this grid of pixels, each one of these squares being a pixel, and I think this is the input image, and I think about creating the output image from this infilter function, um, and I think about the value at this particular pixel here shown in red, then the, uh, the, then the output at that pixel location will be a weighted sum of the pixels in the surrounding area. Let's choose a three by three kernel, as it's called. That, that's the, the array that, that have, encodes the weights for each one of those nine pixels that contributes to the output image there, right? So, um, you know, in MATLAB, this is encoded as a, as a high-performance uh, C function, um, um, but we can uh, we can write that um, here in, in Julia, you know, relatively straightforwardly. So, I'm going to uh, walk you through a couple of different possible implementations of this algorithm. Um, and the, for the first one, I'll, this is kind of the simplest one. I'll just call this one the 2D indexing. And the idea, of, I presume almost everyone in this room has has been writing Julia for a while, but to, just to sort of walk you through it or so, this function is going to take two inputs: your raw image. Um, as well as then the kernel itself. And just to make life very simple, we're going to not make this at all flexible. It's only going to work on grayscale 2D images. It's only going to give floating uh, float64 data type back. 
Um, and none of the, and the real M filter function images is far more flexible than that, but, but there's no point <coughs> in burdening you with that complexity. Um, the, uh, so uh, I should say that in my experience, about 80% of the pain in writing algorithms for images is in deciding what to do when, the, when your core computation doesn't work. In particular, what you should notice is that while this operation is perfectly well defined, for computing the value at this pixel here, you run into a problem because you don't have any pixel values up there, right? And so the, uh, the easiest thing to do as your sort of first step is to pad the image. And um, you know this uh, is a little function that I wrote for just for ease purposes here. And the key call was this function called pad array that was actually contributed by Kuno Farnabach. Um, and it just uh, the default, although it has many uh, or several options, um, is to simply replicate the edges um, to to, to uh, 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 compensate for the for the missing row of pixels, basically. All right, so we allocate the output then. And then we're going to just simply loop over all of the pixels in the image like this. And again, lovely fast loops in Julian, which is great. Um, and we're going to allocate to a temporary. And now we're going to, in, we're, now we're going to loop over all of the different um, uh, coefficients in our kernel, the, all the different weights. And we're just simply going to sum up the product of the, of the kernel terms and, and the padded image, right? And, uh, we have to subtract one for um, uh, very straightforward index if you work if you work it out there. Okay, so we're going to accumulate that into temp, and then we're just going to store the result in our output array. All right, one minute. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, so this performs pretty well, um, and uh, you know, so it's about 17 to 18 milliseconds uh, for a one megapixel image. Just for point of reference, that's on my slow laptop. Uh, for a point of reference, just simply copying a one megapixel array uh, from one memory location to another is about two and a half milliseconds or so. So this isn't bad. It's six times slower than the copy operation, and you're doing nine operations per pixel. So that seems actually like that's pretty good. And your your impression might be you might say, oh, then maybe we can make this a little bit faster or if these really are just plain arrays, maybe we should use linear indexing. And so you might replace the inner loop with something like this. And that doesn't help at all. The, 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 the computation time is exactly the same. So you would be forgiven for concluding that you have plugged away at this as hard as it can go and that you really can't do much better than that. But you can. And the big way in which you can do better is through Julia's metaprogramming facilities. The key is, is that there's really no reason to have a for loop in this function at all if the kernel is small. And so what you can do is you can actually generate a special version of the, of the function for kernels of any given size. So a 3 by 3, a 5 by 5, whatever. And um, I, I'm not going to just walk you through this, but basically the idea is to extract the individual coefficients into static variables. And then you can actually do the computation without doing any loops whatsoever. And when you do that, you end up getting, uh, you know, cutting the, 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 the processing time basically in half, right? So that's that's a big step forward. Um, <laughs> so, um, and uh, in fact, that turns out not to be the best. Oh, that's you. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> So, so for the unrolled version of the algorithm, at that point, actually simply padding the array becomes a significant portion of the, of the time. You have to make two transits through the array data, right? And, and that is bad for your cache behavior and all this kind of thing. So you'd like to get, do it in just one pass through the array, right? That makes things a lot more complicated. This clamp version, you're just simply forcing the, forcing the indexing to always be in bounds, but that adds a bunch of if statements into the inner loop, so that actually makes it slower again. But the, one of the beautiful things about Julia's iterators is, is that you can define a custom iterator. And so I've defined an iterator that only iterates over the edge of the image and yet does so in an efficient manner, basically. Um, and so what you basically do is you sweep through it, not worrying about the boundary conditions in the interior. And then you make a second pass through where you just iterate over the edges of the image. And you can do this in a multi-dimensional friendly fashion. That, that gives you something that's only twice as slow as the actual copy operation. And I should say, using similar techniques, I, I wrote a, 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 a region labeling algorithm in Julia that is three to six times faster than MATLAB's uh, VW label algorithm, despite the fact that MATLAB's is written in C. Uh, so, really, um, do some nice things. Yeah. So, um, 
probably aware of like image J and the redesign of image J too. And I think it's based on that iterator idea that you just laid out. Yeah. So do you see a a role in that and like going forward in your image packages? Oh yeah, no, that definitely. So for right now, if you want to write generic multi-dimensional friendly code in images, you really have to use the Cartesian, um, uh, which some of you may may, may know about. Um, you know, because we don't yet have a really sort of fast iterator object, if you will, right? So what Cartesian basically allows you to do is write for loops that handle any number of dimensions, but also generate these uh, 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 predictable expressions efficiently, right? So uh, repeated types of expressions. Um, and so, uh, but I, I definitely think that hopefully in the not too distant future we'll be able to simplify some of those algorithms and have an iterator object that, that performs that performs the same function but with less, less obvious kind of program. But one thing I should say is it's not sufficient to just simply check, oh, am I in the interior or exterior? Okay, go on to the next pixel. You need to leap over the interior of the, of the interior. You don't get this kind of performance benefit. One last question. So you're clearly the biggest power user of images. Uh -huh. Do you know who is the second biggest user? I, I don't. I mean, the only thing I can gauge is who who's contributing the bug reports or patches, right? So, for instance, I mean, like Run Rock is is clearly a major uh, you know ma major user, but I but, but I honestly don't know. I, I can't remember. I've never tallied how many different people have submitted bug reports, but it's substantially larger than the 14 people who have actually contributed a patch. All right, thank you. Thank you.